The great delusion that's coming is the greatest lie of all time. We hear the media talk about the big lie as a political fabrication, but folks, none of the lies our politicians tell on either side of the aisle are anything compared to the lie that is coming. And unfortunately, most Christians are totally unprepared to discern this lie. They are totally unprepared for it, and that's what's going to make it so effective. That is why so many in our church pews today will be taken in by it, lost, and will go to hell. In this video, we're going to present a chapter from our new book, How to Prepare for the Last Days. If you haven't picked up your copy yet, a link is down in the description, but here is a sample of what it's like. We feel it's a very important book, and Marquis Laughlin, Jake McCandless, and I are putting on conferences throughout the USA based in part on this book. Now, what I've discovered is that churches are woefully unprepared for the last days. You know, the pandemic should prove that to you. How prepared was your church to deal with what happened? To deal with the lockdowns and the mandates? Most were in complete shock and unable to really function. And of course, more challenging things are coming. But you know, 2019, this channel did a video on the coming pestilences and even bioweapons and how the end times will include these things and how to prepare for them. The information is there in the Bible, folks, if we study it. And that's why we wrote this book, because it's so important to get this kind of information out there. Now, the bigger issue, however, is that the church does not understand God's plans for the last days and Satan's plans. If we don't understand why things like the pandemic are happening from God's and Satan's perspective, we won't know how to react. And that is what happened. So at the beginning of our book, we explain these strategies. In chapter four and five, we explain God's strategy, which in a nutshell, is to allow waves of catastrophe like the pandemic to sweep over the world. Yes, God is allowing these things for his purposes. And he does so to shake the unredeemed out of their comfortable lifestyles. If they think this life is giving them all they need, if they're comfortable as they are, they won't be open to hearing the gospel. So God's plan is to shake them up and then to allow them to encounter Christians who show them the love of Christ and present the gospel in order that all who will be saved can be saved before it's too late. That's God's overall strategy. He has always used catastrophes to shake people up. It's just the last days <laughs> will be that on steroids. In chapter six, we then present Satan's strategy. And here it is, we hope you enjoy it. Chapter six, Satan's plans for the last days. We learned in the last two chapters that God has a great prophetic plan to save the unredeemed before it's too late. His plan is to allow waves of catastrophe to hit the earth, to shake the unsaved out of their comfortable lifestyles, and then for them to be ministered to by Christians who show them the love of Christ and present the gospel. However, Satan, the great enemy of Christians, is crafty. He has devised a plan by which he thinks he can actually defeat God himself. And he can't do that with power. God is much too powerful. Satan isn't his equal. Satan isn't even the equal of Michael the archangel who casts him out of heaven. Revelation 12, 7 through 9. So Satan plans to win with deception. He plans to use a legal loophole of sorts. As we learned in chapter 4, Satan tricked Adam and Eve into surrendering their dominion over the earth to him. In this way, Satan became the God of this age or the God of this world. However, the true God trumped Satan's ploy by coming to earth in the person of Jesus, whose death on the cross won back the dominion and the salvation of everyone who places their faith in him. And at the consummation, Jesus will be crowned king of the earth and take dominion away from Satan. However, as we learned in the last chapter, Jesus is waiting to bring that consummation. And this has bought Satan time 
to craft one last scheme to try and undo what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Think of Satan as playing a game of chess with God, move and counter move. First, God created the world in perfection. Then, Satan deceived Adam and Eve in a counter move. Jesus then won victory over Satan at the cross, and now Satan plans one more counter move in the last days. At the fall, Satan deceived the only humans on earth at the time, Adam and Eve. That's how he acquired dominion over the earth. In the same way, Satan is planning to deceive every human on earth in the last days. It's much more complex than the original deception where there were only two. Now he has billions to deceive. But Satan knows what's at stake. When Jesus returns, the deceiver will be imprisoned in the abyss, Revelation 21 through 3, and it will be game over. It will be checkmate. However, as we said, Satan actually thinks he can beat God using this crafty deception. He plans to fool the whole world into signing away their right to repent and be saved, the right that Jesus won for them on the cross. Satan plans to do this with something known as the mark of the beast. You may say, hey, stop right there. We aren't going to face the mark. Well, whether we are or not, please keep reading. Remember that the last days begin like the outer bands of a hurricane, and Satan is already hard at work utilizing those outer bands for this deception. He is laying the groundwork in the media, in government, and even in our churches to prepare people for what's coming. So please continue to read on, as it is very relevant to you your family and your church, whether or not you face the mark of the beast or not. Knowing the enemy's plans in advance is a key strategic advantage. Now, you have probably heard the mark of the beast is eternal damnation if you take it. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. There's no wiggle room in this. The word says if anyone takes the mark, they are damned. It is an unforgivable sin. Now how the mark changes a person to make them unredeemable isn't completely biblically clear. It may be a genetic change, but it is clear that this is what happens. The mark is eternal damnation if taken. When the mark is instituted, the world will be a completely different environment than the one we face today. Because of Jesus' victory on the cross, today people can deny Jesus and commit all sorts of sins but they still have the ability to repent. And if they do, they can be saved. That's how powerful and important the cross is. However, once the mark of the beast is introduced, Satan will have a tool to undo the cross. You probably think this sounds like selling your soul to the devil. And that is exactly what it is. Although this is a popular phrase in culture, it's currently not possible to sell your soul to the devil. People still have the ability to repent. But when the mark of the beast is introduced, people who take it will lose that right that Jesus bought for them on the cross. Now, Satan's no fool. He's doing this for a reason. You see, if every living person on earth takes the mark and signs away their right to redemption, there will be no one left on earth for Jesus to come back to. Satan will be able to say to God, See? They want me as their king, not you. By means of the mark of the beast, Satan will have prevented the consummation, the return of Jesus. He will prevent Jesus from coming back. He will have retained dominion over the earth. And rather than a checkmate by God, it will be a stalemate. And Satan will be happy with that. Of course, not everyone is going to take this hard mark. Satan plans to eliminate everyone who doesn't take it to create a pure 
race of the unredeemable. This elimination is the great tribulation, the hunting down and killing of everyone not deceived into taking the mark of the beast. If Satan is successful, he will have a world that is 100% corrupted. And scripture tells us Satan is going to come pretty close to doing just that. In Matthew 24, 22, Jesus tells us that he has to cut short the days of the great tribulation in order that some flesh might be saved. It's going to be a pretty close call. Satan is almost going to win. Now, the mark of the beast is Satan's biggest weapon, but it isn't his biggest deception. The mark of the beast will be in your face, a clear denunciation of God and his right to a person's soul and spirit. That's a pretty tough pill for anyone to swallow. So Satan has to convince the people of this world to take it, to sign away their right to salvation. He is going to use deception to do that, something the Bible calls the strong delusion. The coming of a lawless one is according to the works of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. The Bible calls the strong delusion the lie, the greatest lie of all time. It will convince people to take the beast's mark and worship him. This is the main reason that the last days are not business as usual. Satan is pulling out all the stops at that time to achieve his plan, and only those with strong faith will be able to overcome it. The lie might be a medical genetic advance, a false promise that we can achieve eternal life scientifically without Jesus. Many people would take a mark to achieve that. It might be a technological advance that we can hook our brains up to a computer and know everything. Many people might take a mark to achieve that. It might even border on science fiction. Satan and his fallen angels might appear on earth in the guise of, quote, aliens, end of quote, saying that they're the ones who created life on earth, not God, and that they have all the answers to our earthly problems. And it could be all three of these lies combined or something we haven't yet imagined. The Bible does not tell us. However, all three of these options do echo Satan's original seductive lies to Eve in the garden. Quote, you will be like God, and surely you won't die. End of quote. Do not laugh these suggestions off. We know the strong delusion will be the lie, the greatest lie of all time. So it is likely something we haven't been considering, something that is powerful enough to cause those sitting in the pews next to us to walk away from their faith. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 3, Paul calls this the falling away, the greatest apostasy of all time. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And notice, it comes before our gathering together to him, prior to the rapture. So regardless of what end time theories you hold, it's likely many reading this book will live to see it. And God's solution is simple. He has given his followers the truth to protect us. The truth is the word of God and the Holy Spirit who helps us understand and interpret it. Satan, of course, knows this. So he is going to do everything in his unrighteous power to prevent the love of the truth from growing within people and protecting them. This is the struggle of the last days. It is a struggle over truth. Key point, preparing for the last days is at its heart, knowing and understanding this eternal struggle between God and Satan and how we fit into this struggle. 
And that struggle has already begun. God has placed instructions in his word, which are truth. Believers who love this truth will trust God and overcome the evil one in the last days. However, Satan is attempting to deceive churchgoers to not love this truth and not understand it. We saw in chapters two and three that most Christians are not being watchful for the signs of the last days. This is Satan's doing. God's word is clear, but Satan deceives us as to its true meaning. And he distracts us from reading it. And the impact of this deception and distraction is that the vast majority of churchgoers will be asleep when the strong delusion, the lie, is unleashed because of this. Many will be foolish virgins who do not enter the wedding feast. And in many other ways, Satan is trying to deceive believers right now. As you continue to read this book, keep this in mind, you are already engaged in the battle for the last days. It is a struggle for your mind, a struggle for truth. God, however, is not going to be outplayed by Satan. He plans to use the catastrophes of the last days in one more way, a positive way that is bound to surprise you. If you'd like to continue and learn what that special use God has for the last days is, well, there's a link to this book down in the description. Go ahead and pick up a copy. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.